This Kant is inverse, is a, has an inverse relationship with the propensity to consume, and the other way around. And in fact, they may even, and I don't know if this is Mises' conclusion, I don't think it is, but it is our conclusion, that the discount rate and the interest rate each go their own way. Because this is international trade and this is interest, which happens to be charged amongst other people, but less on, on the international market. At least then. I haven't come across the word of uh, marginal time preference in, um, in Mises' work. Um, so that's, that's why he probably left it open to, to average, to averaging. And we, I think, you know, we have come to the conclusion that, that Mises did look at this in only from one side, namely the time preference side. And he was right in that, partially, because he didn't look at the marginal, um, he didn't look at the, the protagonist, which was the marginal person in whose role it was to um, do the arbitrage there. The next person one should consider in this picture is Eugene von Bohm, is it Bohm? Bohm Bawerk. I'm not even sure about the von, I think he was landed aristocracy, but he dropped the title, so he dropped the von, I believe. Huh? Never mind, but he, his, his contribution and Mises was a student, huh? a direct student, not only of Knut Wixel, also of um, Eugene Böhm Bawerk. And they fell out on the observation that Eugene Böhm Bawerk made, namely that there is such a thing as the very obvious, you know, you, when, when, did, when did this all happen? Eugene Böhm Bawerk lived at the the end of the Industrial Revolution, he must, I mean, come on, please, he saw the Industrial Revolution, he saw what happened, he knew about the productivity of capital and what it did. This is, this is only, I mean, he, together with Mengele actually, they tried to find, to fight the historical school, but also Marx, because Marx had another spin on this. And, and don't tell me that Marx didn't know about the productivity of capital. I don't believe it for a second. He just chose to ignore it. Let me explain this. This is a bit of applied economics. And here is where it becomes interesting. You, you, as an, uh, in in uh, applied economics, you develop the reflex to think in stocks and in flows and in um, discounting flows to a present value. This is what Eugene Böhm Bawerk observed. Entrepreneurs have a cost of capital. What cost of capital? Well, it's what we would call it today the weighted average cost of capital. It comes with a very smart word, a whack. There's no laughing, but usually there is a laugh in class. A whack is um, quite simple. The following, I am going to use this little drawing here. If you, as an entrepreneur put in your own capital and you have your own capital 100. You also have a bond for 100. So you borrow capital, also 100. 
the bond is issued for 5%, you expect 10%. What is DWAC? Well, the average cost of capital is here, seven and a half. It's expressed as a percentage. I mean, that's the easiest example I could find. If you have your own uh, capital, 100, you borrow another 100, they want five, you want 100, 10% uh, uh, out of it, they want 5% of it. The average you need is seven and a half. What did Eugene Bernbarbeck say? Well, you may have several enterprises, each at, you know, you know when a certain project would give you or would yield a certain percentage, seven and a half is what you need. Uh, let's just say, for argument's sake, forget this WEC, but your WEC would be. Um, here, three and a hundred. Certainly there are other uh, producers and they expect a little bit more, the others expect a little bit less. That is their operating yield. What happened in the Industrial Revolution? Steam machines, steam applications. You don't need all those people anymore. You don't, I mean, production can go from, what was it? You had an example of Two. Bales of cotton that you could... Yeah, 200 to two, 2,000 man-hours to 200 for 100 pounds of cotton. That, that, that is, um, well, that, there's an example with the capital input, which was at that in the beginning that was significant, you know. Somebody had to invent the machine, but you know, once they have the invention, they can multiply that invention, so it became obviously cheaper with every issue of a machine. And it means that the rate of interest, which is tied to the, pro the productivity of capital, shoots up. No, well above here. It shoots up there. That means that means that okay, the local mom and pop shops running at a yield of just slightly over four, four and a half percent. What's the purpose? Put your money in a bond that yields 12%. Not that they could, because you need massive amounts of capital to put into bonds, but look, this is the reason why the small shops have disappeared since 1975, 80s. This is the reason. This is also the reason that von Bohm Barbeck showed in his theory of interest, that all the people, labor, which were employed by all these little um, enter enterprises, they were wiped out, marginalized. Why would you? It doesn't make sense to operate at 2, 3, or 5 percent if the rate of interest, if you put your money in the bank, huh, and then you get 12. So, obviously, he had a point. Uh, however, it was um, Mises who fell out with Bern Barwerk, or was it the other way around? I'm, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, it has developed in, in, in a split uh, for, for some reason, and foolish enough, this has led to a, another 100-year war. Uh, not in uh, physical uh, terms, but uh, funny enough, in, in, in an academic world. Well, mm. okay, two strong opinions. And what happens to strong opinion if you don't have it? Nothing. Luckily enough, Professor Fekete also has a strong opinion. And he did publish, although with some um, hesitance, I believe, his... Um, Synthesis. And the synthesis comes in the form of the um, hexagonal model. So now, 
leaving behind the Hundred Year War, how, much, how are we doing on time? Uh, you've got 15 minutes. Yeah, we started 15 minutes late. Yes. Never mind, we'll um, go into for a rush. Really, what does this red light mean? It's time to change the battery. Thank you. Is a big word. Luckily to the strong opinion of Professor Fekete, and it is I think incumbent on us to uh, build on this strong uh, opinion, this is where I arrive at the model that one should um, try to make other people aware of as much as possible. By resetting the paradigm of the legal paradigm of uh, present goods and future goods to another one, namely the paradigm of looking at not borrowers and lenders but to exchanges, which is a typical reflex of an economist, exchanges between income and wealth and of course an underlying other exchange wealth for income you have a different picture it is not a borrower and a lender who is a person who needs money and the same goes for not only for the um, interest market or the, the, the loan, well we call it the loan market, there is a much bigger equality than you would believe. Take this as an historical example. It is, uh, it is historical because it's true. The Bank of Amsterdam, that's, that, that is, uh, well it doesn't exist anymore but in all these centuries, uh, it was one of the richest banks in the world. And the Spanish crown, it is, it, I mean, it's inconceivable that you would call the Spanish crown a little beggar coming for a loan. No, no, <laughs> no there is no beggar, there is no loan. So, so don't, we, we, we've got rid of the connotations of a loan and a borrower and a beggar, and, you know, he's giving some. No, forget that. There is a much bigger equality. What's the underlying paradigm? Well, that is the exchange of income for wealth and wealth for income. And if you look at it that way and you develop that reflex, it gives you a much broader insight. Done with inequalities, done with the injustice attached to usury and interest. And because it has been framed usually, it has been framed in terms of one person being bigger and higher uh, than the other, it's probably led to all the troubles that we have seen and probably hindered um, expansion of, the, of science, although it didn't hinder people, it didn't stop them. Loans, even under usury, uh, laws, canonical laws, that always happened. There was always a back, a back door. As in, uh, I think it was De Soto's uh, credit in his big book uh, on um, the history of money and banking. He described in big detail what the back doors were, what the solutions of the people were. To arrive at the econometric model without um, much econometrics, one has to take um, a few roles, not people, obviously people occupy roles, but we have a few roles, and it has already been talked about, um, the annuitant with a D and with a T. 
One could say um, the annuitant with a D is the young person, but then again, so is the inventor. And on the bottom axis, due to time constraints, um, I will uh, speed this a little bit up. You could say that there is a time axis here. Time starts here in the origin and flows this in this direction. Uh, I sound like a physicist, but I'm not. <laughs> what are the roles? Well, here's the young person. He starts a family. He doesn't have capital. He wasn't born with a silver spoon, usually. There are exceptions. But he usually needs to convert income to future wealth. That's what we all we say. At 25, go to university, well, at 20, go to university, graduate, get a job, hopefully, and save as much as we can after we have smashed our first car. Then, if we survive our first car, we grow older, get a family, get a house, have some savings. What would you do? Now, under this model, there's only four roles. You hoard your savings with, of course, the most hoardable commodity around, that is gold. And perhaps some silver, but that, that is, well, that that's just sticks to gold. So you can dishoard the gold. But in fact, in this model that is presented, you would love to convert all your wealth into income, which is fine, you know, you, you can just open, open your um, case with gold coins and do whatever you want. But there's more. There's the entrepreneur. He needs to convert wealth into future income. And we have on the other side the inventor who needs income to convert into wealth. These are the younger persons, these are the oldest persons. We can divide them a little bit up. It is a bit of a formal one. On this one side, you have the formation of um, research and development. And on the other side, we have the formation of capital. Now, we can actually start to combine these people into partnerships. These are roles that are assigned. And we have a partnership on the bottom, a partnership to supply the credit. And on the top we have a partnership to utilize the credit. Mind you, this is only valid in normal times. If there is war around, that usually means that credit has been destroyed. I know of very few people that would borrow things to another one during times of war, civil war, uh, unless they knew them very well. So in this formation of capital and formation of um, intangible capital on this side, there is another partnership here, a partnership to supply credit and another one to utilize credit. Now they can of course go and find each other and formalize their contracts. They can find each other. And I have to hurry up a little bit. But those are, in, in, in basic terms, the roles. What if they just missed their opportunity to enter into a contract? What if the entrepreneur has just missed the annuitant, you know, after, sorry, you know, I borrowed my capital to, to Sandy, and I have to tell um, another person, I'm sorry, but, you know, of course, this happens. And in a way, 
When you only have four roles, you have a bit of asymmetric bargaining in the sense that, I mean, you've already observed this, we're going to speak about this in, in, in half an hour, that the inventor and the entrepreneur, as utilizers of the credits, are not really in a position, if they've missed their chance to get into a contract, then they're not in a position to do much bargaining. But if you enter a fifth protagonist, which is the capitalist, then they don't even have to know each other. The protagonist, the fifth protagonist, the capitalist, is the go-between. Usually, the rate of interest, which was, well, we had a time axis here, and we could say that the interest rate was on the uh, other axis. If there is a big spread, it usually means, and this is another reflex again, big spreads usually means that there is something going on with the efficiency. The higher the efficiency, the lower the spread. The fourth or the square model is not optimal yet. There is asymmetric bargaining because the spread here could collapse. If there is zero interest, that means that both the new attendant, the D and the T, could just as well dishold. They could live. Who's out of a job? These people. There's no credit. Credit is gone. Zero interest. These can survive. There is asymmetric bargaining. Tough for them. Except if they have a capitalist. That's our fifth corner, our fifth role. What happens? Well, this specialist breaks the monopoly and reduces interest rates. He is, in fact, the go-between, reduces the spread, improves the chances of people, especially of the entrepreneur and the inventor, to get a job. But there's more. We can still improve. Because the fifth protagonist was the, well, the, pro the protagonist that I've drawn here. Uh, because he theoretically belongs as a go between for the inventor of the entrepreneur. You could do the same for the annuitant. The, you know, we call him the investment banker. Now, this is the beauty we have had. Um, what should I do? Yeah, the investment banker here. So this is now the hexagonal model. It has six rows and six, cor uh, six corners here. With a little bit of uh, a little invention, a little tweak, um, the hexagonal model, thanks to um, our modern technology here, we arrive here. Sorry if I go fast, but we have time to space. And look here. The yeah, I have to do this by heart now. We have a ceiling and a floor rate of interest. And due to the workings of the intermediaries, the investment banker and the capitalist, the spread has reduced to its minimum. Everybody has an opportunity, and we have a very small spread. Now, what is, how is the ceiling and the floor uh, defined? Well, the floor is defined as... Um, I usually have to write this down. So I don't forget, but um, is if I do this from heart, it's by heart, then it is the, basically it comes down to the opportunity rate of, um, help me out here, what, what, how is it defined? 
Sorry. Say it again. How is this flow rate defined again? And marginal time preference? Yes. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the, for the marginal time preference you would find here, and in fact that is Ludwig von Mises through um, Aristotle and Thomas of Aquinas. They actually looked at the flow rate. They didn't look at the ceiling. It was obviously uh, from Eugene Bombard who saw the uh, other half of the market, which is the ceiling. Now, how is it defined? Well, it is, um, if, I, if I'm, I'm going to consult my notes. Okay, come back here. Here's the role for the marginal productivity of capital. It is the ceiling. How do you know it's the ceiling? Well, after the Industrial Revolution and all the shenanigans going on with the Industrial Revolution, you know, if your yield is only X percent and new machinery goes up to the earth, well, you know, you have to get out. You, mom, pop, small business, other businesses, they will be filtered out. If you don't run at a higher capacity or a better capacity with a higher yield, you're out. What, what does that mean? Well, the interest rate will rise, but only to the ceiling, because here there's a mass exodus. At the, at the ceiling, there's a mass exodus. People leave their business. What do they do? Well, uh, hopefully they can get some money from their investment in capital goods. They would liquidate, they would liquidate their um, capital goods, if possible. In any, in any case, they will not maintain them anymore. And what do they do with the rest of their savings? Well, they do arbitrage. Obviously, they are out of the capital market goods and go to the higher yield of the bond market. That's purposeful, purposeful action. Look at the other one, marginal time preference. As people move out of little businesses and, and marginal businesses, they are buying <coughs> they are buying bonds. If you buy bonds, you push up prices. If you push up prices because it's a consistent and persistent um, pressure on this market, you buy these bonds. What does that do to the rate, to the yield? I mean, you push up prices, obviously the rate of interest, the ceiling, is tick by tick coming down. Another reflex that should be obvious to bankers, because that's what they think, that's how they think, that's why they're in the banking industry. Any bond that I have, and that says, printed, haha, 12%, it's on the secondary market, ticks have come down. They only give 11, 10, 9, 8, and so on percent to new bonds. But I'm holding a 12% bond. That's why the price, of course, is coming, is, is, is up. I make capital gains compared to new bonds. If I make capital gains, I'm very interested. I want to write the capital gains down all the way down. But there is a flaw. There is a flaw, and this is the marginal time preference. Now, yesterday we had a discussion that marginal time preference, and it is the dominant force, is very contingent on circumstances. If there is a war, my time, marginal time preference means it's, uh, talk about terms of war, it's a very short fuse. <laughs> I have a time span of maybe hours that I will borrow you, whatever it is that I'm borrowing. But under normal circumstances, life is, life is fine. I have no problem borrowing you anything. My time preference is 
will be, and everybody's time preferences will be affected by circumstances. But obviously, the rate of interest will not be driven through the floor. At certain stages, people say, what? Half a percent? Come on. And they get out. They make, they realize their capital gains. <coughs> Hopefully they don't have to pay taxes on capital gains, but in the States and in other countries they have to do that. Never mind the capital gains, but they have them. And get out of bonds. Again, think reflex. What are you going to do with that money? Are you going back into capital goods? Well, maybe. Probably. Under normal circumstances. You would get the money and you probably have a lot more money because you made capital gains. And then, well, go back to whatever you were doing, which is a horizontal arbitrage. Or you could go do another business, which is a slightly more aggressive arbitrage. Or you draw them into gold. Now, this is the next lecture actually, because the arbitrage between the bond market and the gold coin in your pocket, which feels so nice, you know, gold coins, <laughs> I'm not giving them anymore, they're mine, and I don't feel like giving them. That reduces, that reduces the, I mean, you, you went to the bank with that <coughs> bond. You drew the cash, you drew the gold coin. What does that do? Well, that reduces their reserves. It reduces their capabilities of fractional reserve banking. And I know this is not a point of contention between um, Mises, um, the Austrian um, school, and, and the new Austrian uh, school, that in the sense that fractional reserve banking does not, per se, gives us, how shall I call this, doesn't give us the creeps. As I read texts of the Austrian economists, the American economists, they, they sort of have an aversion for fractional reserve banking. They think it's the second biggest sin ever. I fail to see why. Um, but that's, that is probably another uh, topic um, that we should, we don't have time for that anymore. So, um, withdrawing cash, gold, from a bank reduces their reserves and their capabilities of expansion. That gives the banker the incentive, if this is persistent, and not only by one person, by, but by a series of people, well, they run out of cash, obviously, and they have a portfolio besides the bills, and if they do the maturity matching correctly, they will have to sell the bonds to get cash in. Selling bonds that they, the bank has a portfolio, what does that do? Ticks up, you see? They have to sell at the ask, and that's when the rates at the ask tick up again. That is why there is a floor under a gold market. Never will it be broken. Fractional reserves, be they, they can be what they are, but if you are withdrawing en masse, persistent, your uh, gold coins, rates will come up again. It's a mathematical formula. You cannot look at all, you cannot overlook. Right, uh, before we run out of, completely out of time, I will finish this model. The instrument, of course, here on. Um, we can do this also, and this is the beauty about the hexagonal model, you can do this for fiat currencies as well. What happens there is that we have to adapt the laws that, well, laws, no, let, let me, we have to slightly change the applicable um, theorems here that under a system of fiat currency you have a central bank and that central bank dictates the rates. What is the ceiling here? Uh, well, actually it becomes all of a sudden the marginal productivity of speculation. 
still there is this marginal time preference, but it's slightly adapted here. Here we have the marginal liquidity preference because um, for reasons that we don't have time to go into now, interest rates under a gold standard are uniform. And there's in fact only one. Under a fiat currency system, there's not one yield curve, there are thousands. And the rate of interest um, that I have to conclude with here under a gold standard is in fact, if it wasn't abundantly obvious, it is the result of a market process. And this was the market process. But I would like to also leave you with this. In, under a gold standard, there is only one rate of interest. There is the rate of interest, and that is, in fact, the result of sinking fund managers and certain, well, if not explicit, then, then, then probably implicit references to the gold bond, where if interest rates would rise, you would, would recapitalize that bond. That makes, due to the arbitrageurs operating um, activity, that makes the yield curve not invert, in fact it makes it flat. And there is only one, there's no, there's no um, yield curves long or short. It's flat. What does an arbitrageur do under a gold standard? Is the, well, it's not, a it's not a speculation. He buys high and sells low. This is in fact how the whole in the interest rate, all the interest rates available are flattened by the sinking fund managers who have to do that by contract. And the arbitrageur makes sure that he buys high ones and sells the low ones, and he pushes up the inequalities. <coughs> and by this process, the, the intelligence spread out over all the participants crystallizes in one single figure, which is the single rate of interest, funny enough. So that is where I conclude. Um, the difference is also with the, um, under, the, uh, under the present system, where that is gone, there is no more one interest rate, there is no more flat interest rate. You have uh, several yield curves. Um, <coughs> <laughs> the instrument of the current market as we live in now is the instrument of irredeemable debt. With these two theorems making the ceiling and the floor, and I'll tell you now, I should actually adapt this uh, here by opening the spread, because that is what I should theoretically do. It, it is certainly not um, an ideal one, I have to adapt that. Right, I think I better conclude here. I was going to do this, but we ran out of time. Uh, we'll do this in half an hour? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.